Today, we will be looking at some of the most gruesome crimes in Hong Kong's history. Most of these cases have fortunately been solved. However, make sure to stay to the end of this video as we will also be discussing the recent case of Abby Choi, a model who was found stuffed into a refrigerator only last week. But before we get to that, let's start with the earliest crime on this list. The Tupperware Murderer between February and July 1982, a taxi driver named Lam Kor Wan, born in 1955, also known as the Rainy Night Butcher, terrorised female passengers. He would pick them up on rainy evenings and strangle them to death with an electrical wire before taking their bodies back to his home. Lam was an avid photographer and took pictures and videos of himself dismembering his victims, including performing necrophilia with his final victim. He even claimed to have consumed part of the intestines of his third victim and hoarded their sexual organs in Tupperware containers. After attempting to develop his gruesome photographs at a Kodak shop, the manager became suspicious and alerted the police. Lam was finally arrested on the 17th of August 1982 when he returned to retrieve his pictures. He was found guilty of four counts of murder and initially sentenced to death by hanging but his sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment, without the possibility of parole. The Bremer Hill Murders On April the 20th, 1985, two British teenagers, Kenneth McBride and Nicola Myers, were brutally killed by five young local gangsters in Tai Tam Country Park, near McBride's home in Bremer Hill Mansions. The couple, who were popular students at Island School, were studying for their A-levels when the gangsters, who were members of the local triad, provoked them for fun. Despite finding little money on the couple, the gangsters decided to attack and murder them. McBride was found bound and badly beaten with over 100 injuries, while Myers was raped, had her jaw broken and had her left eyeball removed from its socket. With a financial reward for information, a fellow Triad member eventually provided an anonymous tip to the police about the Nike shoes. This led to the arrest of the four culprits, including Tam Pang Shun Yi, Chil Wai Man, Cheng Yao Hang, and Won Sam Long. As of now, Pang and Chil remain in prison serving life sentences. Tam passed away from cancer while in prison and the two younger gangsters were released from prison in the mid-2000s. The Chun Moon Rapist From April of 1992 to August of 1993, residents of Chun Moon lived in a state of terror as a string of rapes, robberies and murders plagued the neighbourhood. The perpetrator behind these heinous crimes was Lam Kwok Wai, also known as the Chun Moon Rapist, who was 21 years old when he committed his first offence. His calling card involved stalking young women back to their apartment buildings, sexually assaulting them and robbing them. This pattern continued, with Lam committing a total of 13 crimes, including three murders. Lam's reign of terror came to an end on August the 5th, 1993, when he raped his final victim and demanded her phone number afterwards. The victim had the foresight to report the incident to the police, who used the information to lure Lam into a trap. The next day, Lam called the victim to ask her out on a date to the movies, but the authorities were waiting for him and arrested him on the spot. In the end, Lam was found guilty of three counts of murder, eight counts of rape and seven counts of robbery. He was sentenced to life in prison for his crimes. The Hello Kitty Murder In 1999, a horrific murder took place in which 23-year-old nightclub hostess Fan Man Yi was abducted and held captive in a Chim Sha Choi apartment. Over the course of a month, three men subjected her to constant beatings burnings, rapes, and even forced her to consume excrement, resulting in her death. After she passed away from her injuries, the perpetrators decapitated and dismembered her body, 
cooking her remains in a pot, before placing her skull inside a Hello Kitty mermaid doll, and discarding the rest of her remains elsewhere. In May of that year, one of the perpetrator's girlfriends led the police to the scene, finally revealing the shocking crime. Chan Man Lok, Leung Xing Cho, and Leung Wai Lun were all convicted of manslaughter and received life sentences. However, Leung successfully appealed the verdict, leading to a reduced sentence and his release from prison in April of 2014. The Milkshake Murderer the milkshake murderer may not be as widely known among the locals as other notorious criminals, but the case caused a stir within the expat community of Hong Kong when it occurred in 2003, and this case has continued to be highly publicised due to an ongoing appeal. The perpetrator, American expatriate Nancy Kissel, born in 1964, earned a notorious reputation for bludgeoning her husband, Robert Kissel, to death with a strawberry milkshake laced with sedatives. Although Nancy pleaded not guilty and claimed self-defence, it is believed that Robert discovered her infidelity and that their marriage was on the brink of collapse. Robert's body was found wrapped in a rug inside of their apartment four days after he went missing. Despite the case appearing straightforward with direct evidence implicating Nancy as the culprit, it has attracted significant attention due to locals' curiosity about the privileged world of the wealthy in Hong Kong. Moreover, the similarities between the Kissels and some expat families were striking. Robert was a successful investment banker, and his wife was a Tai Tai, leading an ideal life. However, their marriage was plagued with problems behind closed doors. The entire incident resembled an American soap opera, but one that went tragically awry. The Model Murder This is an extremely recent case, as the body, or at least parts of the body, of a model named Abby Choi were discovered on Friday the 24th of February in the refrigerator of a quaint home within the seemingly innocuous walls of Hong Kong. Police were able to find a meat grinder, an electric saw and soup pots containing human tissue and legs stuffed inside. This case becomes even crazier with the knowledge that the former husband of Abby Choi is now the focus of a citywide manhunt while ex-brother-in-law and former parents-in-laws have been arrested in connection with this murder. The murder is currently under speculation, but the assumption is that she was killed over a financial dispute. After she divorced her ex-husband, she graciously offered to provide hospitality in the form of a house for both her ex-husband and his entire family. However, she later decided she needed to move some money around, which required the family to have to relocate. But it is also speculated that she was planning on finding this new location herself. Nevertheless, it would seem that this wasn't good enough for her ex-father-in-law, as he was said to be furious with the situation. And so, it's currently understood that this murder is nothing more than a retaliation to a simple dispute over property and finances. Describing the killing as premeditated and well-planned, Superintendent Alan Chung of the Kowloon West Regional Crime Unit said, The ground floor flat of the three-story house in Tai Po had been carefully prepared as a place to cut up a body. He was quoted as saying, The body parts that we found were inside the refrigerator. There are two legs belonging to a female. We are still looking for the head, the torso, and the hands, which we believe were disposed of elsewhere. The flat had been rented by the victim's former father-in-law, and instead of a furnished home, officers found a place starkly bare of furniture, with just a couch and a table inside. The two bedrooms were also empty, in addition to the meat grinder, electric saw, and two pots of soup containing human tissue. Police also found two types of chopper, a hammer, face shields, black raincoats, and a purple handbag that belonged to Choi. The suspects covered the walls of the flat with a sail, and they put on face shields and raincoats so that they would not get bloodstained by dismembering the body, Chung said. The following timeline will chart the period leading up to Choi's death, and the days that followed. 
In early February of this year, Kwong Kao, Choi's former father-in-law, who is also an ex-police officer, is suspected of being the murder's mastermind. He rented the village house that the body was found in. A typical unit of this size in that area is around 10,000 Hong Kong dollars, or approximately 1,200 US dollars per month. On February the 21st, Abby Choi is reported missing. According to a police insider, Choi's chauffeur and former brother-in-law, Anthony Kwong Kong Kit, was believed to have driven to Kaduri Hill to meet the model, and they were supposed to travel to pick up her and her ex-husband's daughter. But when Abby failed to show up to collect her child, she was then reported missing. Upon receiving the missing person's report, the force contacted the brother and parents of Choi's ex-husband, but their inquiries were hindered as all three provided false and misleading statements. A police investigation also later indicated that the victim's former father-in-law and brother-in-law travelled to Junk Bay Chinese Permanent Cemetery. The reason that they travelled here is still unknown, however it is suspected that the rest of Abby Choi's remains could be located here. On February the 24th, the police managed to discover several of the victim's remains at the village house's ground floor flat. It was carefully prepared as a site for cutting up the body before the pieces were disposed of. The walls of the sparsely furnished flat were also covered with a sail. The legs which are believed to be the victims were found inside the refrigerator, but her head, torso and hands were still missing at the time. The force then arrested Choi's ex-brother-in-law and the former parents-in-laws, but continued to search for her 28-year-old former husband. Eventually, on February the 25th, Abby Choi's ex-husband was arrested at Tung Chung Development Pier at about 1pm on Saturday, after learning of his plan to board a speedboat. The suspect was picked up with 500,000 Hong Kong dollars in cash and several luxury watches collectively worth around 4 million Hong Kong dollars in total. While at Hung Hom Police Station, he complained of feeling unwell and was taken to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. On the same day, the force searched Junk Bay Chinese Permanent Cemetery with members of its abseiling team and police dogs to hopefully uncover the rest of Choi's missing body parts. Members of the police's elite special duties unit, the Flying Tigers, are also deployed to carry out a search of the site's water catchment area. The next day, on February 26th, a skull and several ribs believed to be Choi's were found in a large soup pot that was taken to a mortuary from the village house crime scene. The 50 centimetre deep pot covered with thick fat was found to contain meat believed to be human flesh, along with some radishes and carrots, while human bones were also discovered in a separate, smaller container. Forensic experts also found a small hole at the back of her skull. Police suspect it could have been the blow that killed Choi, with blood spatters in a seven-seater vehicle suggesting she was attacked there. On February the 27th, four suspects appeared in court. Choi's former husband, his father and older brother were charged with murder on the same day, while his mother, Jenny Lee Su Hyung, said to be aware of the plot, were charged with perverting the course of justice. In a separate development, a fifth suspect, believed to be the lover of Choi's former father-in-law, is arrested and accused of helping him to rent the ground floor flat of the village house. This woman, who worked as a masseuse and had been in a relationship with the father-in-law for about six months, was also suspected of renting a luxury flat in West Kowloon. It is suspected this was to help hide Choi's ex-husband. One of Abby Choi's best friends, Bernard Cheng, was quoted as saying, I could never imagine a person who's so good, so full of love, so innocent, a person who would never do anything bad, to be killed. 
like this. My heart is still heavy, and I can't sleep well. You can only imagine the pain that Abby Choi's friends and family are feeling right now, and given that the rest of her remains are still to be discovered, I'd assume they're probably missing a piece of closure to try and comprehend this unbelievable tragedy. But once justice is finally done, and all of the culprits are officially behind bars, I can only hope that Choi's friends and family will at the very least be able to sleep at night. I was hoping that by now there would be a few more details to include for this case, but unfortunately there haven't been any further updates to this story. If the recovery team are unable to locate Abby's remains in the cemetery, I can only hope that a member of her estranged family finally speaks up and helps the Choi family receive the closure that they surely need. Did you know that South Africa is currently third in the world when it comes to serial killers, with a total of somewhere around 120? And to make matters worse, this number was further expanded upon just last month, when convicted serial killer Daniel Smith was arrested for the murder of a young boy over a stolen manga. After his arrest, earlier crimes were soon brought to light, which suggests Smith was also part of a cult and a lot of his crimes were racially motivated. But we will speak more on this towards the end of the video, because as always, we will be starting with the earliest crime on this list. The Tokoloshi Killer Elifasi Msomi, aka the Tokoloshi Killer, murdered upwards of 16 people from 1953 to 1955. Prior to his 18-month killing spree, Msomi also raped and killed a woman in front of his mistress, who immediately reported him to the police. However, while in custody, he somehow managed to escape and went on to kill 15 more people, including five children. He later claimed that the evil spirit of Tokoloshi told him to do it. Msomi was consequently sentenced to death by hanging, and was executed on the 10th of February 1956. Pangaman Elias Zaitafadzi, otherwise known as Pangaman, committed a spell of murders which ran from 1953 to 1959. His hunting ground was a heavily segregated community in Atteridgeville, which had strictly enforced apartheid laws, but this didn't stop him from killing 16 different women. Elias targeted white females in this community, and chillingly his weapon of choice was a machete. Following his arrest, Elias was sentenced to death by hanging and was officially executed on the 14th of November 1960. The Station Strangler Norman Afzal Simmons, affectionately nicknamed the Station Strangler, was a former teacher turned serial killer, who ended his reign of terror with an estimated total kill count of 12. However, he was only able to be successfully convicted for just one murder, a gruesome killing of a 10-year-old boy named Elroy Van Rui. His MO was to lure teenagers from various train stations where he would then sodomize and strangle all of his victims. Infamously, he left a note at one of these sites, taunting the FBI with the message, one more, many more, in store. Eventually, however, he was captured and sentenced to 35 years for the murder of Elroy. He is still serving his sentence to this day at the Drakenstein Maximum Security Prison. The Donnybrook Killer Christopher Zicode, also known as the Donnybrook Killer, is documented to have murdered 18 people over a two-year period spanning from 1993 to 1995. He would choose a home completely at random and would attempt to kill any male occupants in the house. 
he would also drag any female occupants to a nearby plantation where he would rape and kill them if they resisted. Christopher was arrested in July of 1995 and found guilty of 21 separate charges, including 8 murders, 5 rapes, and 5 attempted murders. However, it is commonly known that this figure was likely much higher. He was in turn sentenced to 140 years in prison, which I presume he is still serving. The ABC Killer Moses Sitol, or the ABC Killer, managed to take the lives of around 38 people in just one year, from 1994 to 1995. His nickname was given to him due to the three locations he chose as his killing field, Atteridgeville, Boxburg, and Cleveland. Moses is probably the most well-known serial killer in South Africa, as he would pretend to be a businessman and a charity representative in order to gain the trust of his victims. After he offered them a job, he would then walk them to his so-called business headquarters, and once they were out of sight, he would rape and strangle his victims to death. After finally being arrested, Moses was then sentenced to an unbelievable 2,410 years, and almost comically, he was scheduled a parole hearing for just 930 years into his sentence. The Wemmer Pan Killer Maupa Cedric Marquet, also known as the Wemmer Pan Killer, who probably had the largest rap sheet on this list, was convicted of killing 27 people from 1996 to 1997. Although his kill count isn't quite as high as the others that we've mentioned, but over the span of just one year, Maupa somehow managed to pull off at least 133 crimes, including 26 attempted murders, 14 rapes, 41 aggravated robberies, as well as his murders and other various charges. Maupa targeted single men and women in Wema Pan, as well as Indian tailors in the Johannesburg city centre. Due to the mass amount of crimes adding up, police initially presumed this was two separate serial killers. However, in September of 2000, he was finally found guilty and sentenced to 1,159 years, and just to rub it in, an extra three months. Just as a side note, this is possibly one of the largest prison sentences in history. The Phoenix Strangler Saifo Thwala is unique as he was actually given two nicknames, the Phoenix Strangler and the Canefield Killer, both equally catchy names which are more than justified with a total kill count of 16, raping a further 10, all within the span of less than a year, from 1996 to 1997. It is believed Saifo lured his victims to the sugarcane fields of Mount Edgecombe, with the promise of employment. He would then rape and strangle them with their own underwear, a sick calling card that Sifo used as often as he could, until he was eventually captured and sentenced to 506 years in March of 1999. The Jesus Killer Jimmy McKetta, the diagnosed psychopath known as the Jesus Killer, totaled 16 murders by the end of his killing spree, which lasted just 8 months in 2005. He would rape and murder women who worked on farms in Western Cape, South Africa. He would sit on a nearby hill keeping tabs on his victims before he found his perfect moment to strike. On two occasions, Jimmy actually called the police and informed them of where two bodies were which eventually led to his capture. Jimmy McKetta pleaded guilty to 47 charges, including murder and rape but was shockingly only sentenced to 25 years in prison. However, after his first stint in prison is over, he will be required to return to court, where he will likely receive a life sentence. The West End Serial Killer Jack Magale, otherwise known as the West End Killer, managed to lure 16 women into open areas where he would rape and murder them. Chillingly, he would pretend to be a preacher of the Zion Christian Church, which gained the trust of his victims. Most of these crimes were committed at the West End Brick and Clay Factory, giving rise to his ill-famed nickname. Jack Magale was found guilty on 52 separate charges, including 6 murders, 19 rapes and 9 kidnappings. 
he was consequently sentenced to 16 life terms, as well as a further 23 years without any possibility of parole. The Tragic Murder of Jerobian Van Wyck A rather chilling statistic estimates that there have been around 7,000 murders in South Africa over just the last three months. This number is a rather haunting segue to our final story, which is based in a town known as Claver, home to less than 7,000 people. The same town, Jerobian Van Wyck, was brutally murdered in. Teresa Van Wyck, the mother of the victim, was asked to go to Cape Town for DNA tests as part of the police investigation to confirm if the human remains did in fact belong to her 13-year-old son. Tragically, Teresa also lost another son in 2010, and is now left with only one child. The murderer, Daniel Smith, was arrested, and community members believed that the crime was racially motivated. However, Smith's lawyer later revealed that it was apparently an occult killing to save the town from burning. Smith had a history of spiritual problems and had even killed four people in Seapoint years earlier. Eyewitnesses claimed that Smith had pursued Jerobian and his friend after they attempted to steal mangoes from Smith's garden. It is said that he initially hit the victim with his van and then put him in the back of the vehicle before speeding away. The victim's body was eventually found in a sewerage pipe on Smith's property. Friends say that Smith was a quiet man, a railway worker who had lived in Claver for eight years and had unpredictable moods. Ironically, he was always known for his interest in serial killers. But after this tragic day, the community was left shattered and torn apart by the horrific events. Today, we will be looking at some of the most horrific crimes that have ever occurred within the state of Texas. Most of these cases unfortunately remain unsolved. However, make sure to stay to the end of this video, as we will also be discussing the recent case of Shamaya Hall, a former mother of five who chose to viciously attack her own family just last week, and in doing so, took the lives of three innocent children. But before we get to that, as always, let's start with the earliest crime on this list. The murder of Carolyn Montgomery. Carolyn Montgomery was a 28-year-old cocktail waitress who lived in North Dallas. In August of 1971, she was found dead on her living room floor with kitchen knives protruding from her abdomen and throat. Her six-year-old son was sleeping in his room at the time of the murder. The brutality of the crime shocked the local community. Even more alarming was the fact that the perpetrator was never caught, leaving Montgomery's family to grieve without any closure. The investigation into her murder was extensive, but despite many leads, no one was ever arrested or charged with the crime. In the years since Montgomery's murder, her case has remained a mystery. There have been occasional leads and tips, but none have ever panned out. The case remains open, and the Dallas Police Department has said that they will continue to investigate, as long as they have leads to follow. Montgomery's family have never given up hope of finding her killer, and they continue to advocate for justice for their loved one. Courtney Clayton Courtney Clayton was a seven-year-old girl living in Stamford, a small town in West Texas. In September 1988, she begged her father to let her go to the store, which was just a block away, to buy a drink. Her father watched her walk to the store and go inside to make her purchase. When her older brother Ryan went in to retrieve her, she was nowhere to be found. Her body was discovered six months later, in a field 50 miles away. The loss of such a young life in such a brutal manner rocked the tight-knit community, and the case remains unsolved to this day. The investigation into Courtney's disappearance and murder was extensive, but ultimately, no one was ever charged with the crime. The case has haunted the people of Stamford for decades, and many continue to wonder who could have committed this crime. 
The local police department have vowed to keep the case open and to continue investigating any leads that come their way. The Clayton family has never given up hope and they continue to raise awareness about the case in the hopes that someone will eventually come forward. Cheryl Henry and Henry Atkinson Their love story was one of passion and tragedy. The young couple, deeply in love, had their lives cut short in August of 1990. Their bodies were found in a secluded area of Houston, known as Lover's Lane, and the brutality of their deaths shook the community to its core. Atkinson had been tied to a tree, and his throat was slashed so deeply that he was nearly decapitated. The scene was so gruesome that it left investigators horrified. Henry's naked body was discovered buried under a pile of boards, and it was evident that the killer had sexually assaulted her before taking her life. The four partially deflated balloons tied to a nearby tree, and the $20 bill found next to her body, were eerie clues that left detectives completely perplexed. Despite a long and drawn-out investigation, the case still remains unsolved, and the families of the victims are still waiting for justice. Chandra Payton Chandra Payton's tragic death devastated her family and shocked the community of Addison, Texas. She was a bright college student who worked hard to support herself and her family, but her life was cut short in July 1992. Peyton was found stabbed to death inside the clothing boutique where she worked, and it was evident that robbery was the motive. Her mother later recalled the heartbreak and pain of losing her daughter, and the difficulty of coming to terms with the senseless violence that took her life. The fact that Peyton was not even supposed to be working that day made the tragedy even harder to bear. Despite police having a person of interest, Peyton's killer remains at large, leaving her family and the community with a deep sense of unease and fear. Emily Jeanette Garcia Emily Garcia's story is one of horror and tragedy. A young girl just 15 years old, Emily had her whole life ahead of her, but it was cruelly cut short in February 1993. On that day, she boarded a city bus to go to a health services appointment to determine her due date for her baby, but she never made it to her destination. Instead, she was kidnapped and held captive for 12 days, during which time she was subjected to unimaginable horrors. Emily was raped, beaten and strangled, and her body was eventually discovered on an old stretch of Texas Highway in Canyon Lake. Her death shook the community to its core, and the senseless violence that took her life is still felt today. Emily's family were left to grapple with the tragedy and the pain of losing a loved one in such a brutal and senseless way. However, after decades of effort to bring her killer to justice, Police finally arrested 50-year-old Thomas Ray Galindo at his home in Comal County on Friday, September the 10th, 2021. After almost 30 years, the family of Emily Jeanette Garcia are just happy that they can put this behind them. Amber Hageman Amber Hageman's tragic case has left a lasting impact on the community of Arlington and beyond. The horrifying incident occurred on a seemingly ordinary afternoon when Amber and her brother decided to take a bike ride to an abandoned grocery store. However, what should have been an innocent adventure turned into a nightmare when a monster in a pickup truck snatched Amber from her bike. Despite her screams and the neighbor's quick call to the police, Amber was gone without a trace. Four days later, her body was discovered at the bottom of a creek bed, sexually assaulted and murdered. The shock and grief of Amber's death was felt across the nation, and her abduction led to the creation of the Amber Alert System that has saved countless lives in the years since her tragic passing. Despite the passage of time, Amber's case still remains unsolved, 
and her family continues to seek justice for their beloved daughter and sister. Maria Coroner The gruesome discovery of Maria Coroner's decapitated body in April of 2010 shook the tight-knit community of Louisville to its core. The mother of six had been brutally murdered, allegedly by her own husband, whose white pickup truck was found nearby with two bloody chainsaws on the tailgate. The heinous crime left many wondering how someone could commit such a brutal act, and the subsequent investigation left more questions than answers. Meanwhile, Maria's family and friends still struggle to come to terms with the loss of a woman who brought joy and light into their lives. Detectives at the crime scene said 49-year-old Jose Fernando Coroner dismembered his 44-year-old wife, Maria, and left her body in the street in front of their home in Louisville, Texas. Jose Coroner is still wanted on a charge of murder to this day, as unfortunately, it is assumed that he fled to Mexico after the murder and has friends or family keeping him hidden. But hopefully, one day soon, he will slip up and Maria's family will finally get the justice that they deserve. Misty Lauder The disappearance of Misty Lauder has left a huge mark on the community of Pilot Point, with residents still grappling with the unsettling mystery surrounding her vanishing. Misty's life was plagued by addiction, a struggle that is all too common in small towns across America. But despite her challenges, those who knew Misty describe her as a warm and caring person, who always had a smile on her face. The day of her disappearance, Misty's family and friends became worried when she failed to show up for an important appointment. When they went to her apartment to check on her, they found no signs of a struggle or forced entry. It was as if Misty had vanished into thin air. The police were notified and an extensive search was conducted, but it yielded no results. As days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months, the rumours began to circulate. Some people whispered about Misty's drug connections and the dangerous people she was associated with. Others speculated about a possible abduction or even foul play. One particularly chilling theory involved a local wood chipper which some believed had been used to dispose of Misty's body. Despite the many theories and rumours, the truth behind Misty's disappearance remains elusive. Law enforcement officials have combed through the woods and scoured the area around Pilot Point, but no evidence has ever been found. Misty's family and friends continue to hold out hope that she will one day return, but as the years go by, that hope becomes increasingly faint. Shade Shuler Shade Shuler was a young transgender woman who tragically lost her life in 2015. She was only 22 years old when her decomposed body was discovered in a vacant field near the 5600 block of Riverside Drive. The discovery of Shade's remains sparked a media frenzy, with local news reports highlighting her story as the 13th reported case of a transgender person being killed that year. Shade was known by her chosen name, Ms. Shade, and was last seen wearing a blue and white cotton tube top with straps, blue shorts and black Nike flip-flops. Her body was found wearing a black wig, sunglasses and fake fingernails adorned with diamond studs and pink tips, which were a clear reflection of her vibrant personality and love for fashion. Shade's passing was a devastating loss for the transgender community, which was already facing discrimination, violence, and a lack of basic human rights. Her death raised questions about the safety and well-being of transgender people, and highlighted the challenges that they face daily. Many advocates and activists continue to fight for greater recognition, acceptance, and protection of transgender individuals in society. Nevertheless, despite extensive investigations into Shade's death, the cause of her passing is still unknown. However, her legacy has lived on, 
inspiring countless individuals to speak out against violence and injustice. Her story has become a symbol of hope and resilience in the local area, reminding us that even in the face of adversity, we can all work towards creating a better and more inclusive world for all. Shemaya Hall Shemaya Dayon Shana Hall, a 25-year-old woman, is presently being held in custody at an Ellis County Detention Centre, where she is facing three counts of capital murder for an incident on Friday the 3rd of March. This is a very serious charge, and it could potentially result in the death penalty if she is convicted. According to the Ellis County Sheriff's Office, Hall's five children were living with a relative in temporary custody of Child Protective Services at a residence on Harris Street in Italy, Texas. Last Friday, a caseworker from the Child Protective Services paid a visit to the home and discovered that for reasons unknown, Shemaya was present in the property, which was against the terms of custody. After conducting an assessment, the caseworker determined that it was necessary to remove the children from the premises. The CPS caseworker immediately contacted 911 around 4pm to request assistance with the situation. A law enforcement officer was dispatched to the scene and upon arrival discovered that all five children had been stabbed. Sadly, three of the children, a six-year-old boy and twin five-year-olds, a boy and a girl, died as a result of their injuries. The remaining two children, a four-year-old boy and a 13-month-old girl, were critically injured, but luckily they survived the attack. It remains unclear why Hall was present at the home on Friday, and if this factored into the CPS caseworker's decision to remove the children. Investigators are likely scrutinising every detail of the events that led up to this tragic incident, in order to piece together what actually happened. Court records reveal that this is not Hall's first run-in with the law, as in 2017 she was charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon after threatening a man with a knife. Then, in 2020, she pled guilty to assault causing bodily injury after biting another person. Interestingly, Hall's twin sister, Troy Shea Hall, was charged with murder in 2021 for allegedly stabbing her own seven-year-old daughter to death in South Dallas. Court documents indicate that Troy Shea was deemed unfit to stand trial and was subsequently committed to an inpatient mental health facility. The tragic case surrounding Shamaya Hall is truly chilling, and yet we are still awaiting further news about her trial that may bring further twists to this already harrowing story. Today, we will be looking at some of the most horrific crimes to have ever occurred in Malaysia's history. As the title suggests, most of the cases we will discuss in today's video unfortunately still remain unsolved. However, make sure you stay to the end, as we will also be discussing the brutal case of Nur Sazali Mukhtar, an engineering student whose lifeless body was thrown out of a moving bus on the busy streets of Malaysia's capital. But before we get to that, let's start with the earliest crime on this list. The Love Triangle Murder Back in 1979, a shocking incident rocked the town when the news of Jean Pereira Sinapa's murder spread like wildfire. The whole community was abuzz with the mysterious circumstances surrounding her death. Jean, a former beauty queen, was found dead with multiple stab wounds in a car parked beside the Federal Highway on April 6th. However, the discovery of her body was not the only thing that sent shockwaves through the town. Beside her was her fiancé, Carthagesu, unconscious and claiming to have been attacked while using the bathroom. As the police started their investigations, they found no evidence of any blow to Carthagesu's head or any urine at the crime scene. This led to speculations that his story might not have been true. The investigators also discovered that Jean had been exchanging love letters with a Sri Lankan doctor which raised suspicions of jealousy being a possible motive for the murder. Despite conducting a thorough investigation, 
The authorities were unable to find enough evidence to pin the blame on anyone. Karthagesu was arrested and held in custody for over two years before being finally acquitted in 1981 due to the lack of evidence. The case then went cold, leaving the whole town wondering about the truth behind Jean's death. The incident became one of the most talked about events in the town's history, with people speculating and discussing the possible motives behind the murder. Even after all these years, the case still remains unsolved, and the truth behind Jean's death still eludes everyone. Some people believe that the investigation was botched, while others think that the murderer was never caught because they were too clever to leave behind any evidence. Nevertheless, the story of Jean Pereira Sinapa's murder has become a part of the town's folklore, passed down from one generation to the next. It has actually become a cautionary tale for young girls, warning them about the dangers of love triangles and the devastating consequences that they can have. The Schoolgirl Murder the 1999 murder case of Audrey Melissa Bathanathan, a 17-year-old student from the Methodist Girls' School in Kuala Lumpur, remains a haunting tragedy that rocked the nation. Her untimely death was a horrific incident that sent shockwaves throughout the country, leaving Audrey's family and friends devastated. Margaret Francis, Audrey's mother, was a graphics designer who had high hopes for her daughter's future. On May 17, 1999, Audrey left for school like any other day, walking with a friend for a while before heading off on her own. But little did anyone know that this would be the last time anyone saw her alive. When Audrey failed to return home that day, Margaret became concerned and started looking for her daughter. However, Audrey's absence from school was the first hint that something terrible had happened. Her family and friends began to search for her frantically, hoping that she would be found safe and sound. But tragically, Audrey's body was discovered the next day near Tanaga Nazional substation on Jalan Kinabalu, still dressed in her school uniform. The discovery of her lifeless body was a crushing blow to her family, friends and the entire community. The police quickly arrested two drug addicts who were in the area but they were subsequently released due to a lack of evidence. The absence of any further leads and the inconclusive results of the investigation meant that no one was ever held accountable for Audrey's murder. Audrey's death was a heart-wrenching incident that left a deep impression on her local community. Her loss was a reminder of the dangers that lurk in the world and how life can be unpredictable and unfair. Even after more than two decades have now passed, the memory of Audrey and her tragic end continue to haunt those who knew her and those who followed her story. The B.O. Murderer Norita Samsudin, a 22-year-old marketing executive, was not only talented in her field, but also had strikingly good looks that earned her several offers for modelling gigs. She was a young woman with a bright future, full of dreams and aspirations. However, her life took a tragic turn when she was found dead in a Damansara condominium on December 5, 2003. The news of her death came as a shock to her friends and family, who were devastated by the loss of such a young and promising individual. According to reports, Narita's body was discovered lying on a bed, with her limbs bound by wire and her mouth gagged with a towel. The cause of her death was not immediately clear, but it was evident that she had suffered a horrific ordeal. The circumstances surrounding Narita's death were perplexing, and the overall investigation was very complex, with many possible suspects emerging. One individual was seen leaving her room around the time of her death, with her housemates reporting a strong body odour emanating from the stranger. The investigation ultimately led to the arrest and trial of her ex-boyfriend Hanif Basri Abdul Rahman, who was named as the main suspect in this case. However, despite the prosecution's efforts, Hanif was acquitted in 2004 due to insufficient evidence. The tragedy of Narita Samsudin's death is a reminder of the fragility of life and how quickly it can be taken away. It is also a sobering reminder of the importance of justice and the need to hold those responsible for such heinous crimes accountable for their actions. 
the Yampang murder. Zhu Jian Huang, a 14-year-old Chinese national, made a heart-wrenching call to his father where he expressed of his fear of being beaten. His father was left feeling helpless and worried about his child's safety, but little did he know that this call would be the last time he would hear his son's voice. Tragically, three days after this call, Zhu Jian Huang was found dead in the swimming pool of his Malaysian uncle's home in Ampang. His body showed clear signs of brutal physical abuse, with his limbs bound and his body badly bruised. The uncle, Ko Kim Tech, and two of his employees were arrested in connection with the boy's death. But despite being accused of this heinous crime, all three of them were eventually acquitted in 2010 due to the prosecution's failure to clear up many unanswered questions surrounding the case. The injustice of this situation is compounded by the fact that the case remains unsolved even today, leaving Zhu Jianhuang's family with no sense of closure or justice for their son's untimely death. Ko Kim Tech, who many believe was responsible for the boy's murder, has since disappeared from the public eye and has not been seen since his acquittal. This tragedy serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of physical abuse and the importance of taking these allegations seriously. The failure of the justice system to bring Zhu Jianhuang's killers to justice is a horrible reminder of the many injustices that continue to plague our society, and the importance of continued efforts to combat them every single day. The Shopping Mall Murder The mere thought of a violent attack and murder occurring in a bustling shopping mall without anyone noticing truly sends shivers down my spine. The notion of being surrounded by people yet being helpless to protect yourself or others is a daunting one indeed. However, this was precisely the fate of Mei Go Li Fang, a young woman who met a tragic end on February 17, 2005. Her lifeless body was discovered at the rear of her newly opened boutique in a mall in Petaling, Jaya. What makes this incident all the more harrowing is the nature of the crime itself. Mei Go Li Fang had suffered multiple stab wounds, and there were indications that she had also been sexually assaulted. However, what was particularly peculiar was that the crime scene contained several valuable items, yet none of them had been taken except for the victim's cell phone. This raised questions about the motive of the perpetrator and added an eerie dimension to the already distressing case. Although the authorities had initially picked up a businessman to assist with the investigations, he was subsequently cleared of any involvement after an alibi was established. Despite numerous efforts and intensive investigations, the case has remained unsolved, leaving Mei Go Li Fang's family and loved ones in a state of despair and grief. The tragedy that befell Mei Go Li Fang is a stark reminder of the dangers that can lurk in even the most seemingly safe and secure of places. It also underscores the importance of remaining vigilant and aware of your surroundings, no matter how seemingly trivial the situation may appear. The Bus of Horrors I think that we can all agree Commuting is the worst. From unreliable public transport to congestion, travelling to work can sometimes be an absolute nightmare. But perhaps this final story will make you appreciate the next time your local bus is running late. 23 years ago, a normal bus journey to work turned into a real, living nightmare that took the life of a young Malaysian woman. Nur Suzali Mukhtar was a 24-year-old girl from Malaysia. She had recently returned home after graduating from De Montford University in the UK. On the morning of October 7th, Nur was travelling to her job at a private medical centre in Port Klang, where she worked as a computer engineer. As she did every day from Kuala Lumpur, she boarded an intercity bus heading for Port Klang. But little did she know, this would be the last bus ride of her life. Just a few stops before her final destination, most of the passengers had departed from the bus, all except for Nur. She was now the only person left, other than the bus driver, 
of course. Unfortunately, however, Nur never arrived at her workplace that day, as the bus was diverted, and she was instead taken to Jalan Bucket Tingi. One of the witnesses was a man named Devon, an 18-year-old student cycling to a tuition centre. He claimed to have seen a stationary bus on the side of the road, and suspected that something was amiss. Devon further examined the scene, and this was when he noticed a topless woman inside the bus, frantically slamming her hands on the tinted window of the passenger door. The bus driver then detected Devon examining the situation, and simply shooed him away. After relentlessly chasing after the bus on his bike, Devon then witnessed the bus driver, who was later identified as Hanafi, dump Nur's lifeless body out of the moving vehicle, near a construction site. The body was then taken to the closest hospital, where a post-mortem revealed that the woman was brutally assaulted. Hanafi had stripped Nur Sezali, tied her hands with her headscarf, and then decided to rape and sodomize her. After he was finished, Hanafi then used the same scarf to strangle her. The reports also showed that the deceased had suffered a staggering 44 injuries to the body, including a broken neck. This case is truly disturbing, especially as the victim was simply commuting to work, a choice millions of people around the world make every single day. I'm sure when she got on that bus, the last thing she expected was to be assaulted. But at the very least, hopefully this story will serve as a reminder that when you get inside of someone else's vehicle, you really are putting your life in their hands. In February of 1931, a British woman named Julia Wallace was found dead on her living room floor with several lacerations on the back of her head. But to this day, no suspect has ever been charged with her murder. In most cases, you should look no further than the spouse when investigating a murder, but as you will soon see, in this particular case, it is almost impossible to conclusively identify the culprit. Was Julia's husband, William Herbert Wallace, guilty of her murder? Let's see if we can find out. The Mysterious Murder of Julia Wallace On the 28th of April, 1861, Julia Wallace is born to parents William George Dennis and Anne Teresa Dennis, alongside her older sister, Annie Maria. She lived with her family in Bruntcliffe House, which was a farm located in East Harsley, North Yorkshire. Now, before we dig too much into her background, I feel I must quickly highlight that this is now a case over 90 years old, so the information we have must be taken with a pinch of salt such as the evidence that Julia at one time had faked her age and background. Julia once claimed that her father was a veterinarian surgeon and her mother, Amy Dennis, was a housewife of French origin. But it is heavily argued that Julia was in fact the daughter of a farming family. Her mother's true name was Anne, and she was 17 years older than she had led many to believe. Tragically, Julia Wallace was orphaned at just 14 years of age, and at the time of her marriage to William, she had just three surviving siblings, Rhoda, Amy and William, her other three siblings having unfortunately died. On the evening of the 19th of January 1931, a phone call came in at a popular chess club in Liverpool, England. The caller was looking for a member named William Herbert Wallace. He hadn't arrived yet, but was expected, so a message was taken. The message was from an R.M. Qualtroff who asked for Wallace to come by to his house the following evening to discuss an insurance policy. Wallace was an insurance agent by profession. Qualtroff's message directed Wallace to an address on Menlove Gardens East, a street Wallace was very unfamiliar with. On the evening of the 20th, Wallace set out for the appointment, leaving his wife Julia at home. He headed out to Menlove Gardens West, where he knew and presumed Menlove Gardens East must connect to it. But when he arrived, he could find no such street. He wandered around, stopped to ask shopkeepers and a policeman, all of whom told him no such street existed. Puzzled, William Herbert Wallace journeyed back home. When Wallace arrived at his house at 29 Wolverton Street, Anfield, 
on the night of February the 20th, 1931. He used his key but found the front door bolted from the inside. He went around to the back door but found that door bolted too. There were no lights on in the house, so he began to worry and went around to try the front door again, but it was still inaccessible. Trying the back door a second time, he found that he could enter the house using the key. The door was no longer bolted. He turned on the lights as he made his way through the house. He eventually discovered the dead body of Julia Wallace in the sitting room. She had been bashed repeatedly by a blunt instrument and there were around four lash marks on the back of her head. Shocked, William called a neighbour who went off to summon the police. The police arrived and found very few clues, although a fireplace poker and a metal bar were missing. The police felt that these were the murder weapons and had been taken away by the killer. A small amount of money had been taken, but robbery was officially ruled out as the primary motive, as there just wasn't enough of it. William Wallace was consequently arrested two weeks later. William Herbert Wallace, aged 52, lived in the Anfield area of Liverpool, England, and was an insurance salesman working for the Prudential Insurance Company. On January the 19th, 1931, William went out to a meeting of the Liverpool Chess Club. A senior member of the club approached William during the evening. He told William that the club had received a phone call and that a message for William had been taken. The note stated that a Mr. R. M. Qualtroff wished to purchase an insurance policy. William was invited to visit Qualtroff's home the following evening in order to complete the sale. The next evening, William left his wife Julia to go meet Qualtroff at his home. But as explained earlier, William encountered a problem as the address he was given didn't seem to exist. William put this down to a possible error from the person taking the note, so he continued in his search for the Qualtroff residence. During the initial phases of the investigation, Wallace's behaviour raised a few eyebrows. During the inquiry and subsequent trial, Wallace seemed detached and monotone, if not cold, while detailing the events around the horrible murder of a loved one. He took the stand and failed to impress the jury. The jury did not like the man or his manner, which could have been either stoicism or callousness. They did not understand his lack of expression of any kind, and they knew it hid something. It could have hidden sorrow or guilt, and they made their choice. The court initially found Wallace guilty and sentenced him to hang. However, the Court of Appeal spared and released him. They felt the verdict did not quite match the purely circumstantial evidence. The police were convinced that it would have been impossible for Wallace to murder his wife and still have time to arrive at the spot where he boarded his tram to meet this mysterious caller. A fit young detective sprinted all the way to the tram stop, which showed that this was something an ailing 52-year-old Wallace probably could not have accomplished. The original assessment of the time of death around 8pm was also later changed to just after 6pm. But a milk boy witness who claimed to have spoken to Mrs. Wallace on her doorstep sometime after 6.30pm further undermined the prosecution case. This therefore left Wallace with an extremely narrow window in which he could possibly have committed the crime, yet emerge blood-free and composed only minutes later to catch his tram. Also, Wallace's suit, which he had been wearing on the night of the murder, was examined closely but no trace of bloodstains were ever found. The first theory that I'd like to discuss is that of Richard Gordon Parry. The Julia Wallace murder case sat for almost 50 years, but finally in 1980, a radio program about the case pointed the finger at a co-worker of Wallace's as the killer. According to the story, Richard Gordon Parry, who had an alibi of being with his girlfriend on the evening in question, appeared at a garage the day after the murder took place, needing his car completely cleaned, inside and out. The garage attendant noticed blood-soaked gloves inside the car. However, there doesn't seem to be any further evidence against him, which makes it difficult to say without question he is guilty. Also, the fact his girlfriend provided an alibi makes it a shaky theory in my opinion. But then again, it wouldn't be the first time that somebody has lied for their partner. The second theory I believe is more plausible. A famous crime story writer, P.D. James, declared with absolute conviction that she was able to identify the killer. James was quoted as saying, The prosecution relied on the theory that Wallace made the call himself in a premeditated bid to establish an alibi. 
but this theory was quashed. Richard Gordon Parry, a 22-year-old local who was also a suspect in the inquiry, had made a prank call to Wallace, sending him on a wild goose chase in retaliation for Wallace causing Parry to lose his job. P.D. James believes that Wallace was in fact guilty as charged. She thinks the case became muddled because no rational person could possibly believe the coincidence that Wallace had decided to murder his wife on the exact same evening that a prankster had conveniently lured him from his home and provided him with an alibi. Parry never admitted making the call, but perhaps this was out of fear of bringing suspicion on himself. So unfortunately, this theory will be almost impossible to verify but interesting nonetheless. Now this theory is a little bit more out there, but looking at the evidence, I'd say it's still a strong theory nonetheless. A few years ago, a Redditor ironically named Mr. Qualtroff provided an excellent, well-thought-out theory that concluded a long-time friend of William Wallace's named James Caird is to blame. Caird and William had initially formed the chess club together and at the time of the murder, they had known each other for about 15 or 16 years. Caird knew Wallace's home very well, as he had been to the home many times to play games of chess. With little doubt, these games would have been played in the kitchen due to the need for a table, and thus in the same room as the cash box had always been kept. This could be the potential motive for James Caird, as he would know where to find William's cash. To further back up this theory, Caird knew Julia for many years and was listed as one of the people Julia would admit into the house without hesitation. James Caird also lived less than 30 seconds away from Wallace's house, which would have meant he could have easily got away. The only issue with this theory, however, is that if the murder was premeditated, how could James Caird guarantee that William would get that message? Well, this Redditor would argue, on the day of the phone call, James Caird was at the club even though he was not scheduled to play a match that day, since his chess nights were only on Thursdays. It was also said that Caird prompted Beatty, the fellow chess club member who answered the phone, to pass the telephone message on to Wallace. Caird also followed Beatty when he answered that initial telephone call, and apparently he stood there while the message was delivered to William Wallace. So although it's still quite a stretch to lie the entire hopes of a plan on William choosing to act on that phone message, Caird could have easily held off the plans if William chose not to act on it. Again, as he was good friends with the family, turning up at the residence unannounced wouldn't have raised any flags. There are many other theories out there, but to prevent this video from going on forever, I decided to just lay out the more plausible ones for you today. Like I mentioned at the start of the video, the spouse is always suspect number one in any murder case. So in my opinion, with this mystery having so many red herrings and pitfalls, it leads me to lean towards the most plausible answer, which in my view, would be that William Wallace is the killer. The time of death is shaky, so it's difficult to say whether or not he would have had time to kill his wife, clean up and then rush off for his meeting. Also, it seems to me that Wallace's innocence depends on the word of a milk boy who claimed to see Julia at 6.30. So although I'm certainly still unsure of what really happened to Julia, if I had to give an answer, the killer would have to be William Wallace. Nevertheless, I'm keen to hear your opinions, so please make sure to leave a comment down below, and also let me know if there are any other cases you would like to see us cover in the future. But until then, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.